You're listening to The Dental Guys, episode 111, part five of the Dental Guys book club on zero bone loss concepts. We continue the discussion about zero bone loss concepts with the next chapters on cemented versus screw retained restorations. Can you ruin a great surgical outcome with a poor restoration? We think so. The answer coming next on The Dental Guys. Looking for a lab that understands the bridge between art and science? Check out the Dental Crafters Network. Dental Crafters, one relationship, infinite possibilities. Contact them at 1-800-472-8302 or at dentalcrafters.net. Do you want to learn to predictably place and restore dental implants using the most modern science and technology? We are talking 60 hours of CE in a comprehensive curriculum and live surgical implant placement on pre-selected patients. Head over to restorativedrivenimplants.com to learn more today. And welcome to this week's episode of The Dental Guys. I'm John The Dental Guy. And I'm Wes The Dental Guy. And this is the continued, the continued saga, and I'm mm. loving this, of zero bone loss concepts. I, everybody, we took a little know, got, hiatus, right? We got a little <laughs> break. We, we, we knew that there's a lot of information in here, and you might be digesting this information straight. You might be one of those guys or ladies who says, I'm going to sit down for, you know, eight hours and I'm going to listen to an audiobook straight through. Are you one of those people, Wes? Can you listen well, let me to an audiobook you, if you need straight help, through? If well, John. John. <laughs> because see, I have to sometimes <laughs> take this stuff for me, an audiobook in the car mm. on a long trip, I can do it. I can do it. Yeah. But it's harder for me. When it's like a business book or a textbook, right. like a business book, for instance, there's not a lot of textbooks I've listened to online, but like a business book, I can't digest the information straight up. So, the, but can you do that? Can you, can you listen? Can you go? Can you just go? Audiobooks, just give me, like feed me. I can feed off of an audiobook pretty hard. Okay. All right. right? But you I mean, that, in. It requires a certain amount of zoning, like, and I can really zone out on that kind of stuff. Now, when yeah. I'm reading, like, this textbook, yeah, okay, which is different than, like, even a business book. No, you're right. You know? It's heavy duty. It's heavy duty because I think you have to read and reread as you're reading. Oh, yeah. Right? It's the summary at the end of the chapter is good. Yeah, but you have so to much. go back. Yeah. And you have to, like, okay... This is what this means. And that's the great thing about this book. We'll get well, into more. But let's but talk about, I mean, you, you, you Wes <laughs> Mullins has got, you've got your, you know, you, you are able to hone in on things. Well, you for, mentioned digestion, John. And, and yeah, and, and you, you're able to take like, you, you have these things. And I want you to talk about what well, I, is Wes, I mean, we sh I feel like we should have a segment on the show that's what is Wes into now? And it's going to be where Wes tells you what kind of random thing he has mm. put his entire energy you know, into that week or that month. So, Wes, you were telling me what you had gotten into recently, and I, you just got to tell everybody about this. What are, you, what, are you currently, what are you currently brewing or doing or what? <laughs> well, we're always brewing coffee over here. Well, we know right? that. Yeah, yeah. We're always doing that. But, but this is not coffee. There's a new brew in town. All right. <laughs> There's a new brew. In fact, it's a new fermentation process. <laughs> and we are brewing kombucha. And kombucha. if you don't, I mean, like this is interesting to me because I would have never told you a year ago that I even knew what kombucha was. If I did, I was lying. Well, I don't think anybody knew what it was a year ago, except for people, hippies that had right. go way back, man. So, and, so what is kombucha? Tell us all, because I've heard it called before... T fungus. And that's what it is, man. It's T fungus. Essentially, it's <laughs> basically. Hold on. Let's pause there for a moment. It is T fungus. It is. I just want to be sure I understand. Okay. It is fermented black or green tea. Okay. Right. And it is so. It has some quote unquote health benefits to it. It is a probiotic drink, right? Because you are okay. drinking yeast and bacteria. 
Now, okay. it, it, it's interesting to me because I, I like carbonated beverages. You know this, John, right? I do. I mean, yes. I am you introduced a, me I am to a the soda stream. carbonated fiend. In fact, you bought me a very nice bottle, which is in the refrigerator of San Pellegrino. I just... It's such a nice it's like bottle. The, what is it, it's the twenty fifth like, anniversary or something? I don't know, but it's, it is it's nice. Fancy. I showed it to yeah. Laura, and it was like, man, this is yeah. nice. I don't know that I want to open it. Well, but we know you like carbonation, yes, right. So kombucha um, is slightly effervescent in its first fermentation. Okay. When you buy it in the store, most of the time you see it, and it's flavored with some fruit. Very low calorie drink has very low carbohydrates. So for me, you know, try to stay away from like sugary drinks. I'm just over in the, you know, walking through the aisle of the store and I see this stuff and I'm like, what is this? And my wife knows. She's like, well, it's like a probiotic drink. I'm like, I'm buying some. She's like, but it tastes like vinegar. And I'm like, ah, well, okay, I'll try it anyway. So I try it and I like it. And it has like a little bite to it. It's, it's got some good flavor. I mean, it was good. So these things are like three bucks a pop. Yeah, they're super expensive. Right? Yeah. And I've probably bought less than, say, 25 in my entire life. <clears throat> but I just, you know, here I am wanting to know more about it. And I'm like, dude, I'm going to make this stuff. Okay? Yeah. yeah. So we are. I am in the first fermentation process right now. I've got a two-gallon batch of kombucha. Just checked on it when I got home tonight from work. How's it and doing? We're f- oh, it's doing great. Yeah, I checked the pH of it. We're down below four. We're running into about 3.6 on our pH, which that's not an indicator. Just as long as you're below four, you're good to go because you're not growing mold. You're growing yeast and bacteria. Now, could you die from this? Let's just hold on for a second. If you mess this up. You wouldn't drink it if it if it if it looks looks like it's growing hair. (laughs) There's hair in there. If there's hair in there, then that's a bad that's a bad brew, man. Okay. That's a bad brew. But, you know, the first fermentation's going on right now in the house. So they use this thing to start it. And I use the starter, SCOBY, right? Now, SCOBY. 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 SCOBY is, a, <laughs> is an acronym, right? Okay. For symbiotic culture of you bacteria can't. and yeast. <laughs> so you got to... <laughs> this thing, man, this thing looks you like a You got some goober. SCOBY. This looks like the ultimate goober that you would oh, hawk. Oh, so you basically take like a giant goober, goober, and you drop it into the like Ferment, the tea, for tea fermented and tea. sugar, tea and, and sugar, the, and the scoby's got like the microbes in it. Yeah, it's eating it. It is the microbes, right? Okay. It's eating the sugar and okay. fermenting and creating the fermented tea. Now, okay. I mean, now I did I mean, a little I mean, research on this. Okay, John. Show After me what you, you told me that you were doing that you were going to be mm-hmm. brewing some kombucha, and I actually read that they call it the mother. They call That's the, right. the scoby is the mother scoby. Yeah, here's and the then cool it thing. brews a daughter scoby. Is that true? It Wes? does every time. <laughs> the mothership breeds. It breeds <laughs> a a a child. A and child, that child has been born. That child needs a hotel so a, you can. A Take daughter, it out and a daughter Scoby has been produced. I mean, this is like so pe- alien stuff, man. This yeah, sounds pieces, like a sci-fi movie. Pieces of the mother. <laughs> <laughs> pieces of the mother. Okay. Are in the drinks that you buy at the store and the drinks. Pieces you make at of home. the mother are in the drinks and you buy at the store. That, that's what's good. That's a quote. That's quotable. Right. Pieces, You're drinking pieces of, the of the mother. The mother Scoby. <laughs> the mother Scoby. The mother Scoby. Well, we so, got some daughters forming. So don't you don't ever tell me that I'm the weird guy and the dental guys for eating the same cereal every day. We got <laughs> yeah. this guy over here. You're crunchy. With the mother Scoby, daughter Scoby. You're drinking oh, the mother, man. parts of the mother. So so how long let's okay, so let's condense this, Wes. So how Less long than two does it take? For this process to be completed, when will you get your first drink of homemade, homebrewed daughter Scoby? <laughs> when are we talking? Seven to, okay, so seven to ten days on the first fermentation, then you can drink it then. That's just a plain kom- kombucha. Okay. Then the second fermentation <clears throat> is where you would add fruit to like a bottle. You might add berries or something like that, and then you do a okay. second fermentation. That's where you really get some carbonation. You could put ginger. You can, you can get kind of... 
you know, interesting, creative with uh, the flavoring of the kombucha because the the pieces of the mother will go into the bottle, right? And you okay. cap the bottle with the fruit that you've added to that uh, first fermentation, yeah. and then that continues to ferment. And as that eats the sugars, as the as the daughters, uh, the little pieces of the mothers eat and feed off of the sugars from the um, from the natural sugar in the fruit. And and basically, what it happens is is that you get carbon dioxide released, and it is a effervescent drink. And and honestly, John, I know that you have not had kombucha, right? No, I'm worried about right? it. I don't like but, the idea of it. But listen. I will be, you will be joining me on the Dental Guys podcast, uh, maybe in the Dental Guys studio, and I will serve you. And mark my word, I will serve you your first kombucha that uh, I made. That I don't I know, made. man. It sounds like a it, Rhett and Link. Over uh, the ice. Like <laughs> segment, <laughs> right. Good mythical you know? morning. Here we go. Good will mythical it Dental Guys. Will it kombucha? Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I might try it. I'm not, I mean, I try anything. I'm not, I'm not afraid to try things, but it just, there's something about, fermented especially after i've heard your description of it usually when you hear description of something like this you feel better about it i actually feel worse about it after i know <laughs> don't what's look going you on looked it up that's what your problem i did is, i did i read too much about it well i feel like this is we could talk about that all day and and i hope you guys understand what's going on here i mean what we've got some serious <laughs> nerd stuff happening and that's what's all about speaking of nerd stuff the yeah, ao man. meeting the annual meeting of the implant nerds we'll of the world in a couple weeks, man, is in a couple, a couple weeks of weeks. By the time this is released, it will be it would be here. I mean, we will be ready to basically roll out to Seattle. We're super excited. We got a booth drawing. We got a couple weeks ago. <laughs> it's going to be amazing. We're talking three cameras and a control room. I mean, it's going to be an amazing booth. The AO is really pulling all the stops. Do this right. Give uh, really take this meeting to the next level. And we're just so excited to get to be a part of that. If if you if there's any if there's some for some reason you have not registered for this meeting yet, definitely register for it. Come out and meet us. Say hi to us. Tell us what you want us to cover. Who you want us to talk to. Um, and then also, hey. RDI Restorative Driven Implants. Restorative Driven Implants. <clears throat> it just kicked off. Series one kicked off this last weekend uh, over in Minneapolis, St. Paul, the Twin Cities, uh, which was surprisingly not snowy when I was out there, and Series two is coming. And, you know, the cool thing about what we're going to talk about today with zero bone loss concepts, Wes, is that we mm. talked about this briefly before, but when we started putting together curriculum for restorative driven implants, we we looked at a lot of Linkovicious work and we really used our, our whole idea of how you place an implant. It all came from his study, soft tissue thickness, where you place the implant, the, even the type of implant that we're using in the course really all was based upon what he later published into this book. If you haven't yet signed up for RDI in the fall, it's going to be in Chicagoland, right at near O'Hare. It's a great location, great town mm -hmm. to come check out. Um, go get go over to RestorativeDrivenImplants.com and get signed up. Yeah, there's right a link now. in the description below. Make sure you get signed up because those things fill up pretty fast. I mean, months ahead of time, people sign up for these things. So make sure yeah. you sign up. It's definitely a great investment. It's I already half full, Wes. Yeah, so the Chicago dates are half full, and it's like nine months away. So make well, sure you Well, here's the thing: like, if you're looking for a comprehensive sixty plus hours plus in the United States, yep, right. We're doing going to it do right. Surgery, doing it right. We're going to be doing surgery in the United States on live patients at the end of this these first two series. You go to series three. That's what it's all about: is like being able to actually do it, but then do it exactly what we've been talking about yep. with this We're going to bring the same stuff that we, we're going to be talking about from this textbook and the same stuff we're going to be hearing mm. from the, the, the absolute cutting edge at the AO to a course that, that will do just what our show does. It takes complex things, breaks them down, creates systematized way of doing hey, let things. Let me just say this. Check it out. Is Here's how, here's how f important the Academy meeting is to restorative driven implants and the dental guys our entire faculty is spending sunday morning from seven in the morning until noon five hours after the reviewing, AO meeting. after the ao meeting reviewing what we just heard yep. the people that john and i talked to and if there is anything that we need to incorporate into restorative driven implants <clears throat> or even into our own yep. practices as far as modern implant 
thinking and surgical skills, prosthetic thinking, we're going to be taking our entire faculty to yep. the academy meeting. And then after the meeting, we're having like a post-meeting recap with our entire yeah. faculty on Sunday morning. So that's pretty special, John. Yeah. Yeah, we're excited about it. Definitely go check it out. If you don't know much about it, go to restorativedrivenimplants.com. And Wes, as we get into this show, I am super excited to pick back up where we left off. It's been What's been cool since the time that we published the last couple of shows is that Tomas has put some links to the first couple of shows we've done, has mm -hmm. given us some commentary. We've had some good interaction. Um, he's obviously liking what we're doing. We're liking what he's doing. It's been exciting to get involved with that. But we're going to get into the next few chapters. So if you have your book, go ahead and open to chapter 11 because it's coming right after a word from our sponsor. This is Justin Goodbrand and here is today's tip. Hey guys, it's Justin Goodbrand here with Financially Simple. Knowing now that you must be intentional about improving your sales skills, it's time to focus on the sales process. The sales process begins when a prospective patient is introduced to your practice and it ends when the prospective patient becomes a satisfied paying customer. My challenge to you is to write out every step that your prospective patient will experience. Then challenge yourself and your team on creative ways to enhance each individual step of the sales process. If you have any questions about how to increase the value of your practice or how to potentially double your net worth every three to five years, reach out to us via financiallysimple.com and we'd be more than happy to help you. For more information about today's topic and other dental related topics, head over to financiallysimple.com forward slash dentist. Until next time, make it a great day. This tip is for informational purposes only. Please speak with a competent financial advisor regarding your specific needs. Justin Goodbread is a registered investment advisor with Heritage Investors. Visit heritageinvestor.com, financiallysimple.com for additional information. All right, John, here we go. Chapter 11. It starts the prosthetic section in this book. So this book is divided if you're joining us for the first time and haven't been following the Zero Bone Loss Commentary, the Dental Guys Book Club. This book is divided into a surgical section and a prosthetic section. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason for that because Tomas comes right out in Chapter 11 which is kind of a summary of what we're leading up to and talking about prosthetic factors that help maintain crestal bone levels. And he says right here that the concepts of zero bone loss include restorative factors because the success of an implant and the associated bone stability are measured in the long term. The prosthetic factors are just as important as the surgical factors. Yep. Now, John, he makes a statement on the next page here, the very next sentence. I highlighted it, oh, and yeah. I read it like three times. Yeah. <laughs> when I was, you know, we talked about like reading in the monologue, like how you just read and reread, and I read it like three times. It says, nothing destroys the work of a good surgeon as easily as a poor prosthodontist. That is... So huge. And and I want to stop there before we go on to the next sentence, because the next sentence is equally epic as a thing that he says. You know, we've talked about on our show long before this, mm -hmm. the why we sometimes don't want to be a surgical specialist. Man. And the extreme pressure that you are under those of you who are surgical specialists listening to the shows, there's a ton of them. What you have to do when you release your implant to, into the wild, you know, you, you've spent all this time learning how to place an excellent implant. You've read, hopefully you've read zero bone loss concepts. You're doing everything right. And then you go in, you ISQ this thing. You, 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 you look at the radiograph. Everything's just how it needs to be. And you send that letter to your restorative dentist and you say, okay, it's ready to be restored. And at that point, you would think, right, you would hope that that implant's going to be successful. But the truth is, it, it can be, that work can be destroyed by a bad restorative dentist who, or a what? bad restorative choice that's made. And the extreme pressure that that puts to the point where, and we sometimes criticize surgeons for this early on, but I feel like I understand now. We've had surgeons that we know that in their own offices, they are doing 
more restorative than they probably should be. And they're doing that in some cases because they know that the person who referred this patient to them, if they send it back to that restorative dentist to complete everything, or they don't hold the hand of the restorative dentist, the outcome could literally destroy all the work they put into the implant. And that, I think that's so sad. I think it's kind of sad. I think it's good for a surgeon to recognize yes. that the restorative component is just as important mm -hmm. as the surgical component. And, and he know, goes on to say in that next sentence, he says, in fact, the best outcomes might occur when the entire treatment remains in the hands of a single practitioner See, who performs this, surgery and prosthetic work because, he says, rather than viewing it purely as a surgical thing, it can be viewed as a prosthodontic problem with a surgical solution. And that is, of course, where we got the idea of restorative driven implants. But it's the same right. thought here that, you know, surgeons, I understand where you're coming from when you want to own it. I didn't early on when I remember I was really getting into restoring implants and I was really passionate. This is before I was placing implants years ago. And I was so passionate about, you know, don't, I don't want the surgeon to place my abutment or choose my abutment or choose my crown or make a provisional. Just stay away, man. Because I felt like I was qualified to do that and, and I wanted to own that. But as I started to understand the surgeons that were doing this in their practice, sometimes it was because the general dentist or the restorative dentist were just lazy and they wanted the surgeon to do everything for them. But sometimes it was the surgeon just really cared. Yeah. And I, I used to think, well, that they, they, were, they were just giving in but now I understand more that sometimes they were actually trying to do the right thing for the patient because they they knew that they could compromise the, the result. And the question is, Wes, you know, who should be... I mean, general dentists are placing more implants now than ever. And the question is, Wes, this, is that a good thing? Because you got one side that says that that's a bad thing. And, and there's reasons for that discussion. And then you've got another side of that, which like this book says, it might be the best type of outcome. It could be. It has potential. And yeah. I think it really calls us as general dentists, which I know there's a lot of specialists listening to this, but there's a lot of general dentists. That's our main audience, although it's growing with specialists much more. Um, we really have a, a, a huge responsibility. If you're going to say as a general dentist, you're going to place implants in your practice, you do it all. You know, why are you saying that? Are you saying that from a business standpoint? Are you saying that because you're doing all the steps at the highest level? Yeah. And I think it brings us, this book really is, is, is challenging us to up our game. As general dentists, as restorative dentists, regardless of which side you're on. But if you control all the variables, Wes, like you said, the surgery and the restorative are equally, equally important. There's... Um there's a moral battle, right, that happens whenever you see the lucrative side of placing implants in a restorative practice. Mm. And mm -hmm. I just don't want that to be the reason why you place implants in your general practice. Yes, yes. I just don't want it to be that reason, right? Yep. Because I don't think that you have to place implants to make, make good money in implant dentistry. Exactly. And, and I, I don't want that to be the reason. What I do want you to do if you're considering placing implants is first try to work with someone, whether it's a periodontist, uh, another general dentist, uh, somebody that's in your office that's highly skilled, to raise them up to the level that you feel like that you need to be at prosthetically, right? Like our surgeon that we use, right? He wants to understand prosthetics. Yes. But he doesn't want to do prosthetics. Mm -hmm. And so when we step in like today, you know, I get a text <laughs> that this rehab on this atraumatic or atrophic maxilla and mandible quad zygs, mm. bar over denture, and a lower hybrid fixed prosthetic needs to be done 
and help this you know person out. And he's he said, you know, we've already presented you know the surgical portion of the treatment plan. The surgical coordinator was on the same text, and she was telling me what I said. Did did you all quote provisional prosthetics and transmucosals? And they were like, yes. And I said, uh, said uh, I told the surgeon, I said, I'd like to control this uh, from the very beginning. Do you mind if I do a prosthetic workup and manage the occlusion and manage all the, you know, the, the nuances of the patient's smile? And he was like, please do. He said mm. that, please do. You see, there's so much involved with both, a- both aspects. Now, that's mm-hmm. a full arch situation here where you've had a crash and burn happen, right? Right, right. Don't make such great leaps in your practice. That's my my thing right, right now. So exactly. Just say, you know, if you're if you're don't not make there on both sides, if you don't have the the high level skills of one or the other, then that's okay. And and yeah. find somebody that matches you or or is better than you. And right. then aspire, don't make great leaps. Yeah, aspire to be your best. And you know, maybe maybe your best is always to just do surgery. Maybe your best is always to just do prosthetics. That's great. Uh, and, and, and do that well and partner with somebody who does the other part well. But I think we need to take what we've learned so far to the surgical, because up till now the book's focus on the surgical side. And right. now let's talk about what is it that can ruin a good surgical Inch. outcome. Let's talk about that. And the chapter goes into kind of a brief little bit of yeah. an over an outline about the fact that, you know, you immediately start getting into what we think is the Simple answers to that, Wes. The simple answers. Oh, well, cement. Cement's the problem. Yeah, the right? abutment design's terrible. Right. It's a, you got cement remnants. So we sh- if we use screw retained, then every problem will be solved and we'll never have an issue from, you know, our surgery will be fine. Right. But as, as he goes on to say at the end of the chapter, uh, for example, you can use a cemented restoration from a biocompatible material such as zirconium dioxide, with an mm-hmm. elegant and correct emergence profile, but if cement remnants are left, as a result, will not be successful. On the other hand, a metal ceramic screw retain restoration will eliminate the possibility of cement, but lack of adhesion to soft tissues to ceramic may create a pocket that later, later leads to more bone loss. So it's important to look at the whole picture. And that leads us right into chapter 12, which is the first aspect of this. We're going to talk about the age-old question, Wes, of cemented restorations and screw retain restorations in these next, next two chapters. Not to and I cement or not the, to cement, the right. age-old question, right? Yeah. And John, for how many years in our practice did we just cement retain everything because yeah. that's what we did? And in fact, some of the research that was published that um, even I looked at in mm-hmm. 2012, he mentions it right here, and I yep. just remember this study. It said it demonstrated that there was slightly more bone loss around cemented restorations compared to screw retained. And then in contrast, there was another research published right here about the long-term outcomes of cemented versus screw retained implant supported partial should better outcome with cemented recrowns. You know, right. so now what right. do you do? And you've got you, know, you get a phone call from yeah. John, you call me. You call me and you're like, dude, I just got back from the AO because I couldn't make it. In fact, it was in Seattle the year I had to go to a family member that passed away. And I'll never forget you saying, Wes, we need to see what cements we're using or yep. we just need to stop cementing implant crowns. Yep. And I remember like thinking like, what are you talking about? Like what's mm-hmm. going on? And I remember talking to Brad, the dental lab guy. And here's the thing is like, he was like, this is hogwash, man. This is not happening. This is not happening. And I, nothing against Brad. It's just that he's seen it come full circle. So many times we went right. from screw retained in the eighties, right. To now cement retained. And then now we're back to screw retain. Right. So what's going on? And Glinkovicus is like, what do we do? Right, right. And and the best and the best answer to these questions, the only real answer to these questions is to rely not on our own feelings or case yeah, that you see, I get did real passionate about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's to look at the a split mouth study. And, and let's talk mm. about split mouth studies for just a second because we talk about what are the highest levels of evidence that yeah. we can get in research? And we know that prospective clinical trials, uh, double blind is the best. But in, in dentistry, when you're talking about prospective trials, you can't blind 
the researchers, right? Because everybody, it's you can't you can't blind the patient. Typically, I mean, you either get you can't have a fake placebo implant, right? So right. so the best the next best thing is to put is to use two different designs in the same environment. So to put right. two different restorations into the same mouth, a split mouth study. So Linkovicious, as we're getting used to, has kind of done all this stuff already himself, and he did this study. He did, you know, a patient who had two implants, a screw-retained restoration in one area, cemented crown in another area, and then we had long-term follow-up. He's showing a case here that's nine-year follow-up and found that this study showed that the screw-retained restorations were much more biologically successful. And then this really was 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 hit hard. This was right around that time, Wes, that I talked to you about that, was that we, we discovered that we just really could not remove all the cement from around abutments. And we used to think that was possible if we used all these techniques, which we'll get into later. Um, and now we're seeing that in the last, you know, seven, eight years, nine, ten years even, that there's been a ton more studies coming out about the Well, and I think a lot cement. of case reports too, John, to be honest with yep. you, the more local people in your community that started placing dental implants, it started with your periodontist, your oral surgeon, and then you started to see these complications, and then they would revert, you know, try to rehab these sites, and when you flapped it open and you saw the cement... Right. It was only natural to think, is did the cement cause this? Right? right. And I remember, you know, as, again, these case reports just kept coming out. And then it wasn't long after that, then you started seeing podium speakers. Right. Start talking about, like, we're we're actually considering that this could be a problem. And Linkovicious comes out very strong in this when he says yeah. that, you know— there are certain implant components that get recalled by manufacturers because they're the cause of a problem, and there are certain things we can blame on the surgeon mm -hmm. or you know our assistant messed up. But cement remnants left are always the responsibility of the clinician, and so look, we for, don't for our have younger have audience an too. Yeah, we don't have an excuse for mm -hmm. our younger audience too. Don't think that you won't ever leave cement around a tooth after cementing a crown on right. a natural-born tooth. Now, here's the thing. Just so you understand a little biology here, and he goes into this a little bit later on in the chapter, is the biology around a tooth, Sharpie's fibers mm -hmm. embed some... There's like 11 different directions of fibers, and they literally embed perpendicularly into the cementum. Right. Right? So how protective is... The periodontium, right? It's a strong connection. It's a relatively it's a strong connection. resistant. There's connective a lot of blood supply area. there. It's it's just it's just good stuff, right? So you're going to leave cement and you'll flick it out, or your hygienist will after it's been there for a little while. The tissue responds. It gets healthy. No problems. Huh? Implants are not teeth, but we love to replace teeth with implants. There's only one fiber, and it runs circumferentially parallel to the abutment. And I don't care who yep. you are. I know laser lock and all these, we can we can grow, you know, fibers into the side of our abutments. We've got all this stuff. Hogwash, right? Because it's not been repeated. It's not been a thing that really has shown to reduce any of these complications, right? right. Even it if may there be is better. a connective tissue attachment, which, you know, Ron Nevins would argue with you, but even right. if there was one, well, it's not it's, enough to say, well, enough. we don't have to care anymore. And and I think before we just, because we're going to talk about all the downsides, but what first of all, what are the advantages of cement retain? Because there are some advantages, well, and the biggest, easy, most aesthetics. most important one, I think, is that there are certain situations where it is difficult to, to screw retain. If you yeah. have an implant with an angulation where your screw access hole is going to come out through the facial of an anterior maxillary restoration, there are times when it's impossible to screw retain. There are times when it's challenging to screw retain. You, you know, there's all mm -hmm. kinds of things we have now, angled screw access channels and lingual set screws and, you know, screw mentable restorations and mm -hmm. a lot of ways to overcome some of these things and maybe all of these things, depending on how well planned your restoration is. But there are situations where you have to cement and we'll talk about how to cement when you must. But let's be honest, Wes, the main reason 
that people cement <laughs> is not that reason. The main reason they cement, and he puts this out, is that they're relatively simple, inexpensive to make, and similar to tooth-borne prostheses in many respects. And let's just be honest, folks. Let's be honest with ourselves. If we choose a cement restoration as our default, and that's just all you're doing, let's be honest, that's why you're doing them. You're doing it because it's easier, quote unquote, and you're familiar with it, and it's like doing crown and bridge restorations on teeth. And you know, for many years before I understood, I was doing a lot of the same thing. So was Wes. So, so were a lot of us. But let's at least call it what it was. It was the lack of understanding. So mm -hmm. our goal with this chapter and, and Link of Vicious goal is not to criticize, but to say, hey, let's open our eyes to what's reality. And so he goes through a series of cases and, if, and mm -hmm. shows some of the really dramatic things that can happen when you leave cement, showing you know bone loss and tissue inflammation. But, but the question is, <clears throat> what is, what can we do? What, what's the real cause? What are some of the big issues? And what can we do to try to reduce that? Or can we reduce the risks? First thing he talks about is the margin of the abutment, yeah, the cementation uh, margin. This is, the, this is tough, too, because <clears throat> if you're dealing with aesthetic situations where you're creating a nice emergence profile and you bring that margin up away from the interface so that like because if you're using stock abutment well the stock abutment margin is like three millimeters right down below you know the tissue and how Minimum. do you even clean it maybe that? more maybe more right especially interproximal like yep. if you're dealing with an anterior so the whole thing here is where do you put your margin and one of the things is margin elevation bringing that elevation up to the height of tissue or even above the tissue. But then he poses this question, John, and, I, and, it, and it's, it's basically he does a model um, study basically where he you know, takes a control, which is group one, and moves the margin one millimeter supragingively, right? And then mm -hmm. on the model, they move the margin equagingival and then all the way up to three millimeters. And basically what they show on the model is that, yeah, you can get the cement clean whenever the margin is supra gingival. Every single mm -hmm. time you'll clean it and get it done. On a model, you cannot get, if it's below the tissue, the margin is below the tissue, you yep. can't get it clean. He took all the right. abutments off, can't get Even it clean. Even if it was zero millimeters sub Even if it was equa gingival. Right. You know, it was still so, a problem. They take that same study and they, he says, well, that's just a model, right? That's out of the mouth. Let's do it in the mouth. So mm -hmm. they do it in the mouth and they repeat yep. their results. And interestingly so, points out in that study that radiographic examination, x-ray examination was not enough to see all the cement. Number one, because so often these cements are not radiopaque. Number two, if it's on the facial or lingual surfaces, you're not going to see it anyway because you're going to have it in line with the abutment and the abutment is not going to show that cement if it's facially or lingually. And, it, you know, so you, you have to understand that there is a huge issue here of unless mm -hmm. you're willing to bring your margin supra gingival, which means you have to use a restorative material that is yeah. not going, that's going to be aesthetically acceptable, uh, zirconia based restorations. And it has to be, you have to be able to blend that with your crown uh, in, in, in an acceptable way. You're never going to clean all the cement off unless it's a customized abutment that is a supra gingival margin. And that is a tall order. I mean, it's how many, how many of you listeners out there are doing this? Yeah. How many of you listeners are making all of your margins supra gingival it, in the posterior? Nobody is. Yeah. Wes. I don't. I, 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 Show me. Yeah, I bet there's not a single person. If you're doing that on every case, please send us a message and send us pictures. Yeah, we need evidence. Right? Because cause hands down, man, that's amazing. Yeah, because in order to do that, right, you have to either accept a metal margin on everything. And I mm -hmm. don't know many patients in the United States of America that will willingly accept that. Or you have to be using zirconia abutments on every single case. And I don't know that 
There are a lot of implant situations where I would feel comfortable using zirconia abutments every single time in the posterior part of the mouth, especially on a narrower diameter implant because of other research that's out there about that. So I think we can say most people just aren't going to do that. And so what are we left with? Well, if so let's resign ourselves to the fact, Wes, that most people aren't doing that. So right. what happens when you leave cement? Well, it depends on a couple of things. Right. I love I love what he talks about here. Like if you if you leave cement in a patient, right, that has had periodontal disease. Mm-hmm. Now, once a perio patient, always a perio patient. So a history of perio, whether active or inactive, if you leave cement, get ready. Because Linkovicus says that that's just like tartar. Right. And it's it going has to the same bacteria. connection as a predisposing factor, bacterial just, accumulation, a perio, perio history. It was predictive. Not right. that you you wouldn't have it in patients without perio, but they found that there was a significant connection. Uh, and he, he lists a great study talking about uh, the you know they they compared cement remnants mm-hmm. and cement free. So they had two groups there, and then the cement remnants were split into two groups with and without a history of perio with periodontal disease, and they looked at the frequency of peri implant disease in the periodontally healthy group. Only 11, uh, there were 11 implants that did not show evidence of preimplantitis, even though there was cement, okay? But every implant, every implant in the patient pool that had periodontal disease history, 100% of the implants with cement developed preimplantitis. I think so that great should little... tell you that yeah. it, if the patient has that history, you're going to develop potentially preimplantitis every single time that there's cement remnants. So if you're not placing implants right now in your practice and you refer a patient, okay, to an oral surgeon or periodontist to have an implant placed, when has your surgeon, your oral surgeon, not your periodontist, picked up a perio probe huh. and see if the periodontal status of the patient before they put that implant in is stable or not, or even ask them history of periodontal disease. Oh man. <laughs> That's a loaded question. <laughs> it is, right? Because what there's what he's saying right here is if you have to do a cement retain restoration, right? And there's a history of periodontal disease, we're going to leave cement behind. Right. Unless you use so, supra gingival margins. Unless you use supra gingival margins. Right. You're going to leave cement. Then, and when you leave cement, some it's a guarantee of periimplantitis. <laughs> yeah. So So this is you know, where you have to understand. There are techniques to reduce residual cement, and we're yeah. we there. You know, we don't want to go we through techniques because really you need no. to see photos or videos yeah, or have go. somebody understand this by teaching mm-hmm. it to you. Come to RDI <laughs> if you want to learn, but right, we that's a little pit. Techniques. We have to pitch that. But there's some great photos in here of different ways. Everybody's probably heard of these of ways to reduce the amount of cement you put in the into the crown, you, including indirect dye technique, rubber dam, cord, all kinds of stuff. Mm-hmm. But the bottom line with all of these is it right. does reduce, it reduces the amount of residual cement in certain cases, but it does not eliminate it. So you're not going to be able to use some technique that's going to assure you, even with that, that you're not going to leave cement. So we have to accept the fact that, yes, do these things that you can, re- as much as possible to reduce cement remnants, sure. But if you have a perio patient even if you don't, but especially if you have a perio patient, you just are going to have to make a decision here. Yeah. Are you going to take a risk and, and, and rely cement. on your ability because you're a super dentist or super doctor that you can get all the cement off? Or are you going to make a decision to change the way you restore these patients and consider screw retain restorations wherever possible? And, it's a and great think, chapter, John. I think it really is the hallmark chapter in mm-hmm. where we're at today with cements. Yep. There's some other things that we could discuss in here about cements and things like that that he doesn't discuss that I would actually like to talk to him a little bit about. Yes. And, and Wadwani stuff. As, 
Yeah, and what types of cements that we would right. use reactivity if we have and to that cement. kind of stuff. Reactivity yeah. and all those things. But I think it is a great chapter on where we're at with cements and some ideas about how to design prosthetics if you have to cement mm -hmm. and really what you should be telling your patients here. Because right. with the aid of CT and the aid of guided surgery, you're going to know before you place the implant what you're going to put the patient at risk, you know, to when making your restoration. Because it should be restorative-driven surgery, and you should know before you finish. Yep. On at least single units, even even two, three splinted units, you should know what what's necessary in these situations. So, so let's. So then the next the next chapter we pick up into this idea of screw retain, and Wes summarized it beautifully in the cement retain chapter. You know, you has to make you think, it, even <laughs> if you're not convinced yet, you have to think about this. So so if you're still, if you're still not wanting to do screw retained. I think the only reason you're probably thinking that is because, man, they're they're kind of hard to deal with. Maybe if you're a lab yeah. technician or you're doing your own lab work, you're you're thinking, man, it's kind of a hassle. You know, you got to make multiple components, you got to cement them together, uh, you got to have a very accurate uh, cast, you've got to have uh, dish. If there's issues with uh, emergence profile. You're right about all those things, and that's what he talks about in this next chapter. He talks about the pros and cons of screw retain because. We, we kind of know now, after talking through that last chapter, what some of the biggest advantages are uh, as far as biologic complications. Um, and there's some other biologic complications or some biologic advantages, disadvantages we'll talk about. But what about fabrication of these things? It's challenging, Wes. It's challenging. Yeah. A lot of steps. It's not easy. You have to have accuracy uh, more so. You don't have the wiggle room of adjusting your contacts, you know, between two cemented restorations. Well, I think this really shows how good of an impression taker you are. Yes. And really it starts to show how good your prosthetic components are. Mm -hmm. It also shows how accurate your impression material is. Right. And I think you begin to kind of test the limitations of the systems mm -hmm. and whether you're using OEM product or not. It'll really yep. push the limits because... And, and your ceramics, too, because yeah. you start to get to where you have a monolithic almost type of restoration or right. you have a cemented restoration, you know, cemented slash screw retainer hybrid where you have, you know, a, a tie base of some kind or an abutment of some let kind. Me, let me just... Let me and you have to be able to mask that but have it yeah. all be one piece because if you guys have, you guys have all seen, you've got a crown over here yep. and you've got a stump shade on a tooth over here and that crown looks beautiful in your hand yep. it's a it's a it's a 1m1 but then you put it over that tooth and now it's a 4m1 and you're basically dealing with that every single time on a lot of these hybrid screw rest screw retain restorations it drives lab technicians bonkers well this is exactly my point is that if you are working with a lab as a dentist, you should buy this book for your lab guy. For sure. Because this book is, it has some of the most beautiful step-by-step mm -hmm. -step pictures for your laboratory technician. Yeah. And if they look at you like, ah, it don't matter. Right. Ah, it don't matter. Ah, it does matter. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> if you want to have zero bone loss, right? Right. Let's, let's I mean, start that's with point. some of the most common problems in fabrication, Wes, because that's that's one of the first thing that jumps out of the pay, off the page when you talk to somebody about screw retain. They, oh, there's co it's complicated, it's complicated. And one of the things we've heard about, not so much now, but years ago, was debonding of mm. the crown part of the screw retain restoration from the titanium base or the tie base. And right. I love the summary of that in here. Essentially, you guys have done these before. Probably everybody listening to this has done these restorations. So you have a if titanium... you're a CEREC user too, so this yeah. is more CEREC Yeah, users. you have a titanium mm -hmm. base that is designed to engage the implant, and you have a crown cemented to that. And if that titanium base does not have adequate retention, you're going to potentially have debonding. And he talks, Wes, about the specific recommendations of the height of mm -hmm. this. And, and he talks about having four to six millimeters of height of the tie base, but some manufacturers only having some that are 
three and a half millimeters high manufacturers having those made. And our laboratory, when we saw some of those issues early on, they stopped using tie bases for almost all situations and went to making full contour customized abutments and then cementing the crown over them for that reason of number one, retention, right. and number two, having emergence profile that could start to be developed by the abutment and not having to do all of that with the crown. So we need to understand our tie base heights and communicate that to your lab. And then, yeah, a tie base is a stock a stock part, guys. Right. So, and, you know, it's an unmodified part from the lab. You order a specific, or from the manufacturer, you order a specific height, mm -hmm. and then the lab scans that, or they actually have a CAD file, Yep. and then they mill a crown to that specific. They're developing the emergence profile in the crown, and then they're going to loot the two in the laboratory, mm -hmm. right? And there'll be a hole cut in the top of your crown, and then that way you can take it to the patient's mouth, seat it in place, it's all done. Yep. So, and what, you got to have you know, the tie base that's adequate, and then he recommends uh, blasting, sandblasting with aluminum oxide. Mm -hmm. He talks about specific types of airborne particle abrasion for that. We can You can read through that to share that with your laboratory. Talks about retentive values going up with that. Talks about the type of cement that's used and the importance of MDP. Mm -hmm. Now, we've talked about MDP before, Wes. We've talked about it mm -hmm. when we went through with Marcus Blotz, the APC concept of zirconia bonding. Airborne particle abrasion, you have to have a primer, and then you have to have a resin-based cement. And what is the primer? MDP. And so we know that all of the research supports that the, the strongest bond strength involves MDP monomer, being involved with the cement. And he goes through this cementation protocol. This is, if I had this book with my lab technician, I would just copy page 175 uh, yeah. and, and say, hey, at least look at this. This is how you should cement your my, my crowns onto your titanium bases. This is the cementation protocol. This is the type of cement you should use. And I think that that's going to eliminate a lot of the issues that you've had with your debonding of components, or if you do have a debond, how to re-cement those components properly so that you achieve uh, the best results. And I, I think, so, so I think we can kind of put to bed the idea of fabrication issues. It's not easy though, Wes. We're not saying it's, it's easy. Not. We're just saying it's not you got to follow and, the rules. And some of you, you know, if there's other types of techniques, which we will get into later on in this book. We're not going to skip over things, but you know, the development of the tissue is kind of where mm. he kind of goes into this next is like when you do this type of restoration and you're blowing the tissue out all at one time. Well, that in some situations, you know, we like to talk about it at RDI too, is that there's a blanching that occurs when you mm -hmm. seat these restorations. Yep. Well, how much blanching is too much? We're not going to get into that, but essentially after a certain period of time, that blanching should go away or you could cause some necrosis there. So, mm -hmm. One way to kind of make up for some of these things is to do provisionals, right? right? Or a custom tissue former. So during surgery or uncovering, you you use a custom tissue former on there. That essentially is an abutment that's full contoured to the shape of an emerging crown tooth. <clears throat> or you put a provisional on there. You know, we do provisionals on every anterior that I do in my practice. I do a provisional. Yep. And... And, and a lot of times, you know, yeah, you're going to have to pay. Oh, the patient's got to pay for that, right? You can't give that away for free or you build that into the cost mm -hmm. of your final restoration. It takes a little bit of time, John, but the cases that you do this on, they seat like butter. That's right. I mean, it it's matches worth it. perfect. Yeah. It's amazing. And I think his, his point is well taken here that if you're going to use screw retain restorations, if you're going from a you know, a, a four millimeter diameter healing abutment to a full mm -hmm. contour molar, and you want to have, you know, good uh, emergence profile to minimize your, your contact or your embrasures, then you, you really need to work the tissue more because there's no way that you're going to take this giant screw retain restoration, Wes, and be able to force that down into that. I don't care if you get them numb or not, that thing's not going. And, right. uh, only and, so you need to be thinking if you are going to have the proper 
contours, the proper emergence profile, and be able to have a, a good day when you deliver these wests. Like you said, a seat like butter, you got to you gotta prep that. You got to start that at the day of surgery with mm -hmm. proper provisionalization and custom tissue formers. Day of surgery is ideal. Uh, some type of provisionalization or at least a wider flared healing abutment when appropriate. And then you've got to potentially work the tissue more after healing and maturation of the tissue so that your screw retain restoration is made to emulate or simply copy what's already been established by your provisional. So it goes to place with ease and you're not trying to crank this thing down into place and blanching the heck out of the tissue. So people, that's the next thing you hear from people, Wes, is they'll say, first thing they'll say is, well, if they're kind of wonky to make and sometimes difficult with shade and you get debonding, but then you'll hear people say, I hate delivering these. Because remember, Wes, let's go back and tie this together. <laughs> let's tie what we're talking about right now, guys, to what we talked about in the surgical portion of this book. Where are we placing these implants, Wes? We're placing yeah. them into areas where we will always have three millimeters of thick, soft tissue vertically. We're and that's placing the bare a, minimum. We're placing a subcrustal implant, usually, and we are going to have a platform shifted design. So you're always going to be working in a high tissue environment, a tight tissue environment, a deep tissue environment. You, and so you have to know that if you follow the concepts in this book, seating a, a screw retained crown can be challenging because you're working. Are you ready to numb the patient? Deep. Right. You right. might have to get are, a patient numb. Oh, my goodness. Are you ready to make an incision? Right. Right. I mean, like, that's the thing here is, John, is like years ago when I started lecturing about screw retain restorations and I started lecturing about subcrestal placed implants mm -hmm. years ago, 10 mm -hmm. years, the number one thing at the end of the the whole thing is like, well, Doc, I don't want to work below the tissue. Like, can't we use... I mean, Yep. I don't want to numb the patient. Every time. You know how many times? Every single time. And it's not from the surgeons that you get this, right? It's from the restorative docs. I don't want to deal with blood, right? right? What we forget about is, is that it, implants is a marrying of surgical principles to restorative principles more mm -hmm. than anything else in dentistry. We are dealing with biology and not just materials, Yep. I mean, seriously, right? I mean, enamel is not is a rock, right? I mean, you, you cut on enamel, you can etch it, you can bond it. It's a 99%, you know. Yeah, it's mineral, in pretty much. Yeah, it's enamel, it's rock. But you start getting into bone right. and soft tissue, right? I mean, like, that's going to be a little harder. And so I think, you know. Yeah, and it's important. We always talk about this on the show that we're not trying to make things... Like we, we want to, and I think Link of Vicious is the same way. We want to try to systematize, yeah. but the more we systematize these things, we're not simplifying because <laughs> it's not simplification. In fact, if anything, the more we read through this, the more we realize it's very complicated. It's hard. In fact, the more you start to understand the biology, the more technically demanding the prosthetics become. It's not going to be easy to follow these principles, but that's okay. That's okay because if you understand what you're what we're talking about here, have that conversation. How about this as a takeaway? If you understand this and you're convinced that you should be using screw retain restorations, how about talking to your surgeon, if you're not the surgeon, mm -hmm. about some type of same day custom tissue former place mm -hmm. the day of restoration or the day of placement especially if it's an immediate into a socket that can keep that emergence profile rather than having to recreate it later on. If you're going to commit to using screw retain restorations, I would challenge you to look into that type of, uh, mm -hmm. of approach. I think it will change your, your world and it will start to make things actually a little bit easier. But if you, if you do everything the same way you've always been doing them, doing it, and then you try to just say, okay, well, I'm going to follow the surgical part of zero bone loss concepts but I'm going to do my restorative the same way that I've done it up till now, uh, not numbing the patient using full contour screw retain restorations or something. It's, it's, you're going to have a bad day and you're going to think 
that you're going to be frustrated and the patient's going to be frustrated too because you're not prepared. But if you know this is coming, like Wes said, you might make an incision from time to time to, to make room for that restoration. You might anesthetize the patient more often. You may work the tissue more. But in the end, you're, you're not going to ruin the surgical setup that your surgeons give. And you're going to become, I can tell you this, Wes, from experience, you, you know it. You were just talking about how the surgeon just sent you this big case. If you do some of these things we're talking about as, as restorative dentists, it will set you apart in your community. You can become the restorative dentist that your surgeon calls when they have a case that they need help with or someone's struggling with. Mm -hmm. This can become a great thing for your business, for your practice, for the patient who you can help through a difficult situation because that surgeon knows, I can send that over to Wes. I can send that over and I know that it's. It, it, I've done everything to the highest level that I can and my level is going to be matched or exceeded by the restorative. And that's what we're trying to promote through going through this book with our general dentist colleagues, our specialist colleagues. That's what it's all about is being that person in your town and your community who is at the level where you're going to become that person. And every single one of you listening to the show can become that person. I think these chapters have been a great contrast, well, is... Wes, as to some of the biggest questions that we get asked when we talk about implants, and I think he's handled it beautifully, really he's elegantly, really good. using a, some science to kind of prove it to us. It's a great way to introduce yourself to where we're at today. I think it is totally 2020, and, mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's where we're at today. And it's where I've been for quite some time, where, John, you've been as well. So as we shut the book on this chapter, we look forward to the next chapter, which we start to look at when multiple teeth are missing. Mm -hmm. How do we achieve zero bone loss concepts? We'll talk about that in the next uh, commentary at the Dental Guys Book Club on zero bone loss concepts. And we're super excited about what's to come. Again, we will be at the Academy meeting. Super excited to see you there. If you're not signed up, please sign up now. And uh, we're excited about uh, the people we're going to get to talk there. Who you know, people we're going to get to talk to there in a few weeks. I tell you what else: if you're not going to be able to be there, please follow us on the socials. We have a Facebook page at the Dental Guys. We have a Twitter page at the Dental Guys. We have a YouTube channel, the Dental Guys. We have a website, thedentalguys.net. We can be found on Apple Podcasts. We will be streaming live, right from from Seattle, right? Yep. Coffee yep. capital of the world, right? <laughs> Implant capital for at least this year. <laughs> right. But we are super excited about that, and we really appreciate you guys listening to this show. We couldn't, you know, get it out there if it wasn't for you. And so if you like this show and you know someone that might like it, please, that's how people find out about us, is share it with a friend. And then something else, too, if you're listening to this show and you haven't given us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, please do that. That's how people. That's how we move up in the ranking there. It really does help us. It does make a big difference. So if you want to give back in a special way, please leave us a review. Reach out to us on Facebook. Facebook. They, they've, you, know, you can leave reviews there. Mm -hmm. But, um, John, this has been another great episode. This is like Geek's Corner when we do this stuff. It is. Like, I get super passionate because I believe it, right? And and it, it, it makes you feel good. I'm, I'm just going to say this. It makes you feel good <laughs> when something you were doing, like, turns out to be like, man, yeah. That's what he says really we works. should be doing. Yeah. It really does work. And that's that's this is book. It really does help me be a better clinician. So pick it up, head over to Quintessence Publishing right now. Pick up a copy of Zero Bone Loss Concepts. We appreciate Quintessence for publishing Zero Bone Loss Concepts. So until next time, for John and Wes's kombucha, stay tuned. We are the Dental Guys. <laughs>